This is an encounter between Fidel Castro and it's someone playing Fidel Castro and the artist, an artist we're going to look at today, an artist I wrote my master's paper about named Alexis Novoa, who's a major figure from Cuban performance art and art in general from the 1980s and into the 1990s. But this is a performance he does in New York City in 2007 at a place called Exit Art. And this performance is addressing or this performance addresses the heyday of performance art in the late 1980s with someone pretending to be Fidel Castro and the artist Glexis Novoa giving Fidel Castro a tour of the gallery. And this is the subject of my master's paper. So if you look on your um, syllabus, you you can see a link to some of the stuff we're going to look at today. So let's start, first start off looking at this kind of fabricated encounter between uh, Glexis Novoa and Fidel Castro, someone playing Fidel Castro. And I'm going to go play this one. So as you can see, this is Artist on the Left introducing himself and meeting Fidel Castro. Someone who does a really good job looking like Fidel Castro. He's wearing a jumpsuit that Fidel Castro thinks that wore to the end of his life as he kind of shifted into the twilight of his tenure. And it's clearly meant to be somewhat comical, if not satirical altogether. And this man is, of course, playing Fidel Castro, and he's going to the artist Alexis Novo on the left is going to give Castro a tour of some documents from performance art in the 1980s. And I think you should notice that Fidel Castro, if you read the captions, is speaking very much like you would expect Fidel Castro, a lot of platitudes, a very kind of nostalgic view of, of the past, and is sort of a know-it-all. So we're looking at photographs from um, the era of performance art. I'm going to just kind of skip through. And so he's kind of giving, it's basically like a, a reflection on the history of performance art in Cuba um, alongside this man pretending to be or playing Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro said, it's very interesting, this type of work. This work brings back a lot of memories. I might buy it and take it with me. So Fidel Castro is kind of saying stuff without really saying too much. I want to skip ahead to this part where we um, see um, a picture of Robert Rauschenberg, a famous Amer artist from the United States. So here it says, um, this is the American artist Robert Rauschenberg. And Fidel Castro responds, I know him well. A few times we spent up till three in the morning speaking, and we'll be talking about Robert Rauschenberg's visit to Cuba and um, him meeting Fidel Castro in 1988 um, in the first half of the lecture today. See, and so this is really a, a chance for the artist to reflect on his contributions, um, Glexis Novoa's contributions to the Cuban art scene in the 1980s. And now we're going to look back at that Cuban art scene in the 1980s, and we're going to look at it from the point of view of uh, Leo. Oh, that's great, Leo. No worries. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, if you're just joining in, I'm showing you guys some video from a performance piece by an art, Cuban artist who now lives in the United States, and he's showing uh, someone playing Fidel Castro, um, taking a guided tour through the memories uh, and documentation of performance art in the 1980s. So we're going to be looking at that after taking a um, first, and then we're going to look at um, art from Cuba in the 1990s during what's known as the special period. And you notice we're kind of returning to this podium. We'll get back to this at the end. Uh, the podium and the microphone is almost a motif of this latter part of the 20th century in Cuba. Here's a man standing on the Malecon, which is the Bayshore Boulevard at the coast on the shoreline of Havana. And so someone has made these rusted microphones and it's sort of a throwback, if not a direct throwback, to a painting we saw last week, which we'll see again. And this is a picture from a, an exhibit um, in 1992 
reflecting on uh, the Cuban art scene. I'm sorry, 2000. This is from 2017, uh, reflecting on the Cuban art scene from this period. And so there's a lot of um, kind of. This is a great time to look back at a period in the 1980s, 1990s, and into the 21st century because we're talking about kind of the age leading up to the death of Fidel Castro, the return of Che Guevara's um, cadaver to to Cuba. And of course, as we see the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Adios Utopia is a reference to, you know, perhaps the, the what would you call it, the disillusionment perhaps of the Cuban um, dream of utopia. And we'll see how that disillusionment comes about from the 1990s. You can recognize a few of the paintings here, of course, the one on the right. So why leave utopia in the 1990s? I mean, if you have utopia, why leave it? Well, we'll get back to that question after uh, the first half of the class. So in 1988, Robert Rauschenberg, a famous artist from the United States whose work you probably have seen if you don't know his work um, uh, already. And he's very well known because he's a major figure from the United States in performance art, as well as in abstract expressionism. And his work kind of bridges that gap between pop art and ready-made or found art and or abstract expressionism. And here you can see him in his studio next to a painting commemorating or paying tribute or honoring the, the death or re reflecting on the death of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So his work is, I think, uh, pretty abstract, but also borrows a little bit from the Andy Warhol um, idea of, of finding familiar pop culture iconography and using that as a, as a subject matter. And we'll see um, Robert Rauschenberg's uh, work that he makes um, while on a global tour in the late 1980s in solidarity with people around the world, particularly communist countries, but also other places. So he, at the twilight of his career, uh, launches this self-funded endeavor to build bridges around the world using his art. And he's a very fitting person to do this because he has a very um, versatile, um, I guess, eclectic career with um, worldwide notoriety. And I think the performance art element of his career really makes his visit to Cuba um, very important, particularly because he visits Cuba in the heyday of performance art in the late 1980s, right before the fall of the Soviet Union. And in that period between 1985 and 19, let's say 1990s, there's a lot of censorship in Cuba, a lot of uncertainty because the Cuban government is worried about the collapse of the Soviet Union, which will have major, major implications on the future of Cuba. And so Cuba, the Cuban government responds with a lot of censorship. And there's a window in Cuba where there's a lot of, um, there, where the art world is uh, sort of reacting to that censorship. And there's a lot of performance art and a lot of kind of metaphorical uh, performance that tackles criticism of the revolution from more of a metaphorical point of view, or at least uses the safety of performance to um, kind of incrementally challenge the revolution. Now, just remember, keep in mind, it's very hard to, um, you know, to stand, to criticize the revolution when everything about Cuban life is revolutionary, vertically, horizontally, inside and out. So, you know, performance art might offer a sense of safety because you're working with other people. And so, you know, there's strength in numbers. So we'll see that in a moment. I just want to show you some examples of Robert Rauschenberg's work. And we've seen some Cuban artists try to filter Robert Rauschenberg's work through a more Cuban lens, which you see here. And they're really, I think, clearly kind of commenting on this, using the same language of found art, um, abstract expressionism, and maybe turning subject matter out of everyday objects. And it's a different thing to do this in Cuba versus in the United States, particularly because we're inundated with pop culture in the United States, but also there's the language barrier. And in Cuba, you're gonna find that the availability of materials might be different. And so therefore the, the symbolism of the materials used might shift slightly depending on which country you're in. And we'll see this is somewhat relevant in terms of Cuba in the late 1980s because, um, uh, well, for instance, the scarcity of paper, uh, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. So um, Robert Rauschenberg takes this global trip in 1988, 
the paintings he makes are all really him kind of as a, like a tourist visiting these countries briefly and documenting whatever he thinks is a sort of and refining and and filtering into works of art um, whatever imagery he sees in the country that he thinks is adds adds or contributes to a uh, a visual a visualization of of the country so he's kind of taking a, the fish out of water Alexis de Tocqueville approach Alexis de Tocqueville was a famous French political commentator who visited the United States in the I think late 1700s, I want to say maybe early 1800s, around then, and was like a fish out of water who offered a more objective outsider view of the fledgling United States and really shows the importance or the value of an, a fish out of water because a fish out of water is able to kind of see things that perhaps people in the water can't see. And so there's a lot of, of problems with being a fish out of water. Maybe perhaps you aren't really in the water, but also you're giving, you're, you're taking a perhaps more superficial look at, at the place. And so he will receive a lot of criticism for his approach, but I think you also have to understand there's a language barrier. He doesn't speak every language in the world. And so I think he's doing his best with, um, by, by sort of turning his artistic intuition as he visits these countries and trying to find some kind of artistic bridge by documenting things he sees in the cities he visits and then putting together an exhibit of the artwork he makes from that documentation. And you'll see it's a little bit of a shallow look at the country, but nevertheless, I think an important chance for an outsider to offer a perspective on the country. And that's what we'll see in Cuba today. So it's a very ambitious idea and perhaps a little overly ambitious. Um, and also, I think very much in the spirit of the late 1980s, uh, with the Cold War seemingly ending and people wanting to build, build bridges between the communist world and the capitalist world. And the arts are, are possibly, if not besides sports, are one of the best bridges to build between countries with otherwise insurmountable political obstacles to a working relationship. So here we are looking at some examples of artwork he makes in China. Um, and this turtle is, is he has a pet tur he has a pet turtle named Rocky, and so his turtle becomes his kind of motif or his uh, brand or his spokesperson, his the symbol of this uh, worldwide tour, which is also called Rocky. Uh, I can't remember; it's an acronym for the 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 tour he's doing. So I think you can uh, take a look at this work and appreciate it, and see that it's um, he's trying to honor local. Um, local, the local context, what he sees in the local uh, worlds he's, he's visiting, um, either in terms of uh, documenting photography with photography, or maybe finding uh, what available things made of paper, posters, um, but I think mostly photography. He's really using photography as his primary tool and putting everything, filtering everything then through silk screen. So, and so whether it's photography or found kind of posters and things like that, it's all filtered through silk screen and then um, put on display for, for people from the country to see and marvel over or gawk at or wonder about. And you would probably expect people from the co different countries, like in any world, in any place, will have different reactions to his work. And you can appreciate that he's trying to honor the local uh, what might you call it, the sort of uh, the everyday world that he visits, the, the world of everyday life um, by um, discovering and maybe appreciating the characteristic elements of the places he visits, whether it's, um, you know, ch distinctly Chilean elements um, or distinctly Chinese ele elements or, you know, in Mexico, he's got the Mexican flag in the middle with the eagle. And you could see he's maybe finding uh, advertisements and collecting them all together and putting them all on a silk screen. Now, as you probably can tell by now, one of the problems with this approach is um, there aren't a lot of people in the pictures. And I think that's partly because, you know, there's the language barrier and it's, you know, a short trip. So how deep can you really, how deep can your roots sink in a short amount of time? Um, I think it's, it reminds me of when I was in the Peace Corps in Guatemala, I often hosted people on couchsurfing.com 
And it was sort of like two different worlds meeting. The, the world of the couch surfer, someone who's traveling through Central America and visiting many places very briefly. And those people would often envy me because I was in one place permanently for many years. And after people travel for a long period of time, you want to take root. You want to deepen your relationship because everything feels very shallow and superficial after a while. And so that I think is kind of what Robert Rauschenberg's doing. He's getting a very quick, almost tourist-like view of the country, but that comes at the at the cost of not quite deepening the interpersonal relationship between the people in the country he's visiting. So given that 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 kind of that inadequacy acknowledged, um, I think we can still see a lot of the merits in his effort here. Even just the uh, the motive to build bridges with other countries using the arts, I think is very noble. And I do think his different works of art here are very fittingly reflective of the countries he visits. Like this feels very, a lot more Soviet, um, you know, and this feels more like the colors of Mexico. You know, it might be as, as basic as the flag, but nevertheless, I think he's doing his, his darndest to honor the countries he visits. And remember, there's, you know, depending on the country, there's big political barriers and maybe paranoia about the United States. You know, we're still living under the specter of nuclear annihilation, at least conceivable nuclear annihilation. And here's Robert, some more examples of Robert Rauschenberg's work that are, you know, apart from his more, I guess, political um, interests in building bridges. And I love his, you know, I love his work. It's more of a, an artist artist. I don't think most people would, who are not artists would, unless they're little kids, um, a lot of people I think might have a hard time. They might say, oh, it looks great, but like finding some meaning in his work is a little harder unless you're more visual or intuitive. Um, and yet there's something so intuitive about, about his work, his ability to combine things that are unexpected and the results are unexpectedly gratifying. Uh, you know, even his th combining like found objects that aren't flat and this might be something he doesn't do so much in the countries he visits because, you know, it might be a matter of going to thrift stores or what's he going to do, buy things from people. So I think that's one thing that's absent from the paintings we're looking at today is when he visits these countries, he's not necessarily replicating these more three-dimensional dioramas that you see like here. And he's definitely notorious for this kind of artwork. And this is the kind of thing you'll see if you ever go to New York, if you go to the MoMA. I personally... I think it's a little distasteful to use animals or any taxidermy, but this is kind of from a different era. Um, and here is the kind of work he makes in Cuba. So this literally is an example that we'll see today from his visiting Havana in 1988. So you can see, like I said, he's filtering photography onto silk screen and then washing it all with kind of one monochromatic color. And you know, it, it, it puts everything in the same field with the color unifying everything. And it kind of, it is almost like, like a nationalistic brush that unites these disparate elements like sugarcane, a uh, reference to the flag, um, you know, horses. So he's clearly going into the countryside, or at least the, you know, suburban parts of Havana and visiting, but notably not necessarily taking photos of people so much as the landscape, the environment and elements that he thinks are, you know, distinctly Cuban. And I do think he has a, a, a great and a new unique Kind of opportunity here because he's visiting all these different countries he he will immediately notice the difference aesthetic difference between one country and the next so you know i think anyone should envy this trip that he takes but it isn't without you know problems or at least it isn't without its own limitations i should say and i think you can maybe see that in the artwork that we're going to look at from his um, visit here you know they're all very much in that rauschenbergian intuitive uh like, I don't think any of them suffer at all from visual inadequacies, but I think it's hard as an outsider to document a country, either because you are an outsider and it's not necessarily your place, but also because of that superficial view you might have. But that might also be a plus or a minus, depending on the place, depending on the painting. Now, one big criticism leveled at him is that, is that he's sort of a neo-imperialist, that he's using his sort of macho man size uh, ambition, uh, U.S. ambitions to um, kind of do this this very self-serving, globe-trotting um, world tour, and you could see how easy it is to kind of criticize and look at look at it as just more of like a tourist kind of 
uh, tourist view of other countries. But if you know Robert Rauschenberg's work, you know that he's that he's a uh, he's he's a very credible artist and I think a uh, credible human being with good intentions here. Um, but you know the pathway to hell is of course paved with good intentions. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see any uh, hell is definitely not the destination here today. Um, though I think in the 1990s, Cuba starts getting closer to, to perhaps that description as we'll see later. So here's Rauschenberg in Havana, sweating profusely. And, you know, Cuba can get be like swelteringly hot in, the, in, the, in August, in July. And, um, you know, he's documenting things with his camera and you can really see this is the kind of what he would do, walking around town with his camera, looking at things. And, you know, that is his, his tool for um, connecting to people or to um, you know document things in Havana. And so here's some more examples of his work when he visits Havana in 1988. You know he's shifting the colors. Um, maybe some Santeria imagery with that skull there on the left that looks kind of like Santeria imagery. Um, neoclassical colonial architecture, Che Guevara, sugarcane, and you know you imagine what what might someone do for the United States like you know McDonald's. Uh, cornfield. So, you know, at the most extreme cynical point of view, it, I could see Cubans especially being very critical of this, you know, dot representation of their country, the same way, you know, if someone visited the United States and you know, offered a kind of to simplify, reduce the United States into a series of paintings, it would be, you know, subject to the same scrutiny or criticism. Um, but, you know, I think you can err on the side of being um, a little more generous and forgiving for his, um, uh, efforts, at least because they are so, uh, you know, I think motivated by, you know, the, the, the purity of an artist and not really, maybe behind him, there are forces that are um, bigger that are at play, like the end of the forces wanting to end communism or end the Cold War, at least. Um, and, you know, that's, that's probably a good thing to end the Cold War. This one's a little more interesting for me just because he's, you know, locating people in a, in a, in a place you know, I can see people, you know, these, and you can see Cubans. Um, there's almost like a reference to the colors of the flag. And what we're going to look at today in a moment is uh, he will host a series of talks in Havana with translators. And he does this because he realizes that he needs to build more, get more of a personal relationship with the locals. I think he realizes you know, it's just putting together an exhibit isn't enough. He needs to have some kind of conference where he engages with locals and talks about what he's doing. And that's what we'll see uh, in a moment. And that's what my master's paper uh, tackles. And this is a poster he makes announcing his conferences that he'll give, one at the Museo Nacional, another at the Castillo de la Fuerza. And these are major uh, cultural institutions that basically Robert Rauschenberg takes over. And in fact, when he exhibits his work around Havana, he'll take over every gallery and museum in the city. And this is the kind of thing that local artists in Cuba will, will kind of scratch their heads about that here in 1988, the Cuban government has given over all of its cultural institution to this American artist, uh, US artist. And you right, might have noticed already from Robert Rauschenberg's art, it's not like he's the most politically radioactive artist. I mean, his work certain, certainly isn't apolitical, but it's not like he's some kind of, uh, you know, overtly imperialistic, you know, uh, propaganda generator for the United States. No, his, if anything, his artwork's kind of abstract and like removed from the political discourse. And so that's probably why the Cuban government is so welcoming, because they probably had a hard time finding anything that would make the Cuban government look like it's somehow selling out to the capitalists, right? So these posters are neat because these are kind of, uh, I think these are actually a little more interesting than the paintings because they're just that they feel more human scale perhaps and more focused. Um, you know, Che Guevara's picture will, is ubiquitous in Cuba, same with Jose Marti. You, won't, you will see Fidel Castro's imagery, but not in the same way you might expect like, you might expect, like maybe in China, you'll see Mao Zedong everywhere. Um, in Cuba, the equivalent would be Jose Marti and Che Guevara. Um, so that was smart of Fidel Castro not to make himself as much of like a kind of uh, as everyday as as Che Guevara is, because at least Che Guevara is a martyr 
um, when you're still alive. It's a little narcissistic to put your picture everywhere. So here on the right, you can see Rauschenberg's goal. It says, to break down barriers, I think you need to see as an alien does, to get lost in the city or in the country, to see things in Cuba that maybe you are blind to. So this is kind of him absolving himself and or justifying his sort of short-term visit and the, the value of whatever visualizations he makes from the short-term visit. And here are a few other posters he makes for the conferences he gives in 1988. We'll be focusing on this one, the one he has at the Castillo de la Fuerza. So you notice he's got this little star. He starts using this little star as a to substitute the letter A, but also because uh, the, the star is ubiquitous, around the world in communist countries, um, particularly in Cuba, the one star in the flag. So it's both a communist symbol, but I think a, a really clever way to find a bridge between, you know, East and West or communism, capitalism, you know, United States has a star in it, in the flag and the star of, you know, communism. So it's a, you know, a very clever, almost comical, um, it, because he's using like a scratchy kind of chalk or, or crayon, it becomes kind of a funny reduction to the sort of lowest common denominator or the one common denominator. And that star becomes a, a motif in a lot of his artwork here. And, you know, almost looks like a human being, the star. It almost looks like his pet turtle. So I think he found a really clever, very simple symbol that it will be the one kind of repeating th theme in the artwork. Um, and this, of course, is announcing this conference that he gives um, on April 3rd, 1988, held here in the uh, Castillo de las Fuerza, which is a colonial uh, military base at the mouth of Havana Harbor. Now, what happens during this conference is what it makes it so interesting because this artist here, Glexus Novoa in the plaid pants, you can see him leaning over and Robert Rauschenberg is there holding a paintbrush. Now, I don't want to get into my master's paper so much as just to mention that a lot, a lot of my paper is about the fact that all of the commentary about this exchange, about this meeting between Rauschenberg and Glexus Novoa are inaccurate because most people are repeating other people's testimony about what happened, which is inaccurate. And also because people really couldn't see what was going on because they have this big poster there. So a lot of people in the audience couldn't really see what was going on. And what's so striking about this is, um, you know, remember there's this big language barrier. Rausch Robert Rauschenberg doesn't speak Spanish. So he's sort of trying his best with to overcome the barrier between him and you know Cuba and the Cuban people. And in addition, there's another barrier on the other side, which is, you know, the Cuban government, everything is revolutionary within the revolution, everything outside the revolution, nothing. So anything that happens in Cuba has to be almost officially sanctioned or or part of the official program. And what Glexis Novoa does here is very much outside of the official program, not only symbolically, but also literally he's putting up this curtain to block, almost block what he's doing in the foreground. And this results in Glexis Novoa having this one very impactful personal exchange with Robert Rauschenberg and vice versa. And this comes in spite of that language barrier, in spite of that iron curtain. And it's sort of a moment when Glexis Novoa and Robert Rauschenberg are sort of outside the revolution having this artistic exchange. And it comes kind of while there's this fanfare going on all around them. And yet it's almost like they've excluded all that from their, their, their exchange here. They've isolated this little bubble of kind of free exchange between two countries. And it's really powerful and meaningful. And I think way more powerful and meaningful than they realized at the time. And a lot of people don't really know about this because like I said, they've, they, they didn't look, well, what I did is I went to the Rauschenberg Foundation and watched the video from this. And when I watched the video, I, I had noticed, oh, he's actually, the, the thing that Robert Rauschenberg is painting here is not the poster there on the back. Everyone in the in all those testimony about this will say, oh, Robert Rauschenberg painted that poster, you'll see. So in a moment, I'll get back to that and explain it. But first, let's talk about Glexus Novoa. So he's very important in the performance art scene in the 1980s. And if you remember, we're talking about this first generation of artists in Cuba who were trained by the Cuban Revolution um, and very much the sort of 
the the champions of that first wave of artists trained by the both champions of the revolution, but champions also of the revolution's uh, support for art. And so these artists have a very interesting role or challenge out of being, you know, true artists and, you know, innovating and making artwork that they that that they want to make, but also having to honor the revolution, which paid for their schooling. So, you know, you guys are all artists. Imagine if the United States government, you know, not just like financial aid, but imagine the United States government paid for your schooling. Well, that might mean you have some kind of either tacit or like outright obligation to the government uh, to make artwork that is you know, I don't know what you want to say that sort of serves the government or at least doesn't criticize the government. And I think that's kind of the situation in Cuba where, you know, if the government is paying or paying for your schooling, there's almost an unspoken rule that, you know, you you should, you know, honor the hand that feeds you, you know, don't bite the hands that feed you. Um, but of course, you know, that's not at no artist worth, you know, worth their paint is going to, you know, is will will just come, you know, absolutely just serve the government. You know, I th would think an artist would serve their artist, their artistry, um, and serve that overall. And so that's the co challenge or the dilemma of these artists wanting to be relevant and meaningful to, you know, average Cuban and to their own, you know, sense of artistry, but also not get in trouble from the from the Cuban government for um, making artwork that is challenging and or counter-revolutionary. And again, performance art is a very interesting blurring of that boundary between art and everyday life. And I think that goes a long way in explaining why it became so important in the late 1980s, because it offered a sort of safe space for making art without that problem of perhaps challenging the, the state's monopoly on imagery. And we saw that member with Antonia Itis, and perhaps artists flee or retreat into performance and conceptual art because it's a little safer than perhaps making imagery, uh, especially politically loaded imagery. So let's continue forward and see how that plays out. Um, so some examples of, of Glexus Novoa's art, you can see here, it kind of reminds me of Du Buffet or maybe even some Jean-Michel Basquiat, the colors. Um, I love this so much. I love the colors. I love the style from the 1980s. Very, this is very much what things were like in the 1980s. This is called, it was, this is, the term used then was a ghetto, ghetto blaster. I think the word ghetto is a little out of favor, but this was exactly, or a boom box. You would walk down the street with your batteries and your boom box playing music. And the, the clothing here is totally 1980s. So I, I personally feel uh, a wave of nostalgia looking at this. But I really enjoy Glexus Novoa's painting. I really um, find this work of art really wonderful. But his kind of main thing is performance, we'll see. Well, not his main thing, but certainly he's a major figure in the performance art world, not just in the visual arts. And you can see some documentation of the photography or some photography documenting the vibrant art world in the late 1980s. And remember, again, the last class we talked about Volumen Uno, which was really the first wave of artists trained under the revolution and successive waves into the 1980s will continue this sort of flourishing art scene in the 1980s in Cuba with the revolution opening more in places for people to uh, to uh, put up art shows. So it's not just having to put it in a private residence. So by the late 80s, the Cuban government is starting to understand that it needs to um, offer more places to to show art, because I think the government run, understands that the more art, the the more art places where they can show art, the more they're sort of supporting the revolution by showing that the revolution is in fact supportive of the arts and um, is in fact a trailblazer of the of the arts. And I think by now the Cuban government realizes there's increasing international interest in the Cuban art scene, and this will only help generate more support for the revolution and or maybe is a as a scape valve for um for societal pressures that are maybe increasingly um uh not supportive of the revolution for various reasons remember we've seen waves of people leave cuba during the Mariel boat crisis and also people fleeing the economic situation now the soviet soviet union has been propping up Cuba for many decades by exchanging oil for sugar. So Cuba certainly isn't as desperate as it will be, as we'll see in the 1990s. But nevertheless, Cuba remains isolated geographically and politically. And so even if 
the economic situation isn't as bad as it will become, there are a lot of forces making people or uh, exciting people to move elsewhere, like to Miami or Mexico City or other places. We'll see Venezuela eventually. So that's still, that was the case in the 1980s. And I think the art scene um, maybe offers a opportunity for people to kind of think about, you know, staying in Cuba and contributing to the cultural, um, to the cultural, to the culture of Cuba. So these doc, these photographs, I think, really show you the, you know, even though, you know, for all the criticisms of communism, Cuba, I think, has a very communitarian spirit that dovetails nicely with the communism. Um, and people are always outside. If you go to Havana, you'll be you'll marvel at how um, how much socializing goes on outside. Um, maybe now today with smartphones, it's less so, but I still think I'll bet it's, it's still uh, a very, very different environment than come to the United States where we're all kind of isolated on our phones and there's not as much socializing, especially after the pandemic. So this looks like someone's here breakdancing. Breakdancing was a big part of the 1980s. You know, Michael Jackson um, dancing period was a big part of the 1980s. So, you know, I, I absolutely love seeing anything that, you know, from that spirit, spirit of the 1980s. So, these are all again. These are all just showing the the vibrant art scene in the 1980s. You can, this is Glexus Novoa commenting on it. Uh, you know, art art for art's sakes, and this lack of commercial forces. That's so important for you guys to remember that you've got an art scene that doesn't have that commercial force. You know, like for example, when I was in New York City, I lived there for 18 years. I did a lot of drawings of people in the subway, and one person came up to me one day. This is like 30 years ago. I'm only 20 years ago, and uh, after I was drawing people in the subway, guy comes up to me and says, well, you know, you know, you can't keep making art unless you commercialize it. Like basically he says to me like, well, that's fine and good that you're drawing people. But if unless you figure out a way to sell your art, like you're wasting your time, basically. It's such a funny kind of comment to make. And I think there might be some truth to what the guy was saying, but it just reminds me of this this picture here, you know, at Cuba, you don't ever necessarily have to commercialize your art because it's not a society that's based on sort of, sort of competing with each other. And so it's really might be hard for us to imagine what it must be like to be an artist in an environment where you're not trying to be a celebrity artist or, or, or you know, having to commercialize your art. Um, and yet we know that that doesn't mean that you have unlimited freedom to work, but it does mean you have a slightly different context than what we see in the United States. And of course, when Glexus Novella and Robert Rauschenberg come together, then you've got these two kind of two representatives of these two different worlds kind of meeting. And that's why I think it's so interesting. And it certainly does look like an artsy event, doesn't it? You know, a lot of people, younger people, and you can still look at how multi, you know, how diverse Cuba is. You know, it's really, you can't really, you know, most people at Cuba, I think it really can't, you know, it's a blended country in ways, uh, you know, and even more so perhaps in the United States in terms of, you know, racial blending. Um, and I think that's probably changed and continues to change. Uh, but Cuba is certainly a kind of a, a wonderful melting pot of uh, people and culture and, and the art world definitely benefits from that heritage, whether it's the Afro-Cuban or the proximity to the United States, Mexico, Latin America, and of course, the Soviet Union, uh, the influence of the Soviet Union. So here's Glexus Novoa doing a performance piece. I think you can appreciate he's not in that sort of super serious Cindy Sherman vein so much as in more kind of comical prankster um, vein perhaps that we saw from a little bit of Ana Mendieta. But of course, he's working in the gallery in Havana doing performance. And you, here it says, in 1986, Castro had announced a plan to rectify Cuban socialism. And some artists saw this as an invitation to act as a critical conscience of society. So basically, Fidel Castro is kind of putting his finger into the wind and realizing there's changes going on in Cuba and in the world, and perhaps the art world needs the culturally you can have have more openness without necessarily eliminating the revolution. I think that's what he's talking about here, and he's saying Alexis Novello is saying they the, they got the perception that the government Cuban government had given them an inch, and though so they'll take a yard. It's kind of funny. That's kind of what he's showing here. A unit of distance uh, measurement. So that's why performance art really takes off because they 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 feel like there's a little bit of a a window of opportunity and they 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 charge into that opportunity. And 
that results in um, the Cuban government kind of having to kind of reflect on, you know, well, maybe you don't want that much. Uh, maybe we've given artists too much of, uh, you know, a, a too long of a leash. And so you will see a lot of censorship, but the censorship is not so much in response to the art world as much as a response to the Soviet Union um, opening up culturally and economically to the West. And this will uh, become an existential threat to Cuba because it depends almost entirely on the Soviet Union for oil. So the Cuban government behind the scenes in this night, late 80s is definitely worried about the uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. And these performance artists are kind of sensing blood in the water or a feeling that change is in the air. And so it's in this kind of peak moment of kind of uncertainty when Robert Rauschenberg visits Cuba and does his conference at the Castillo de la Fuerza, which is interrupted by Glexis Novoa and his group of artists called a grupo provisional, grupo provisional. And so this quote describing the attendance, describing the conference by Rauschenberg, you can see that people look pretty bored. And if you watch the video, it is pretty boring. Um, it's hard for to talk about Rauschenberg's art uh, because it is somewhat abstract. And, you know, I think he, what he does is he's trying to justify his his trip to Cuba to Cubans who are kind of looking at him, wondering why this this Yankee, this U.S. artist is able to take over all of their cultural institutions with artwork that's probably as apolitical as could be, especially given the very politicized context of Cuba. The Cubans must have thought like you know, a lot of them probably had no idea what to make of, of Robert Rauschenberg's artwork, which is both very big and ambitious, but also kind of lacking in overt politics you know it doesn't have the stuff of political cuban posters for instance so you know this quote here is by art of cubans who were engrossed in resolving more pressing problems than those presented by the traveling tortoise and the tortoise is a reference to robert rauschenberg and his turtle um, rocky is a symbol of his efforts here so you know i think some of the art might resonate with Cuba and Cubans, um, perhaps, in the, the, especially with Alexis Novoa, he thought that the found art, the ready-made art objects from um, Robert Rauschenberg were really neat, and was, he was a big fan of that. He was a little more critical of Robert Rauschenberg's sort of macho-sized um, scale artwork, um, and also for the fact that Robert Rauschenberg's exhibit was desecrating, in his words, um, uh, or defacing some of these cultural institutions. I don't think Glexis Novoa took that so personally so much as him just wondering at noticing that the Cuban government is so welcoming of this U.S. artist to the point that he's, quote unquote, defacing cultural patrimony in order to mount his exhibit. And this, like, like I said a moment ago, criticizing the macho man size proportions. Uh, this is straight out of Novoa's mouth, um, but as we'll see later, this this kind of macho scale um, will go on to influence uh, Glexus Novoa's artwork. So these posters that he makes, even this one here the, the Glex, uh, that we saw earlier, uh, Glexus Novoa would, when he, he heard about this conference from the posters and he quickly swiped up all the posters because there was a scarcity of paper in Cuba. So that's a great, you know, just a little, another example of just sort of the kind of thing that Robert Rauschenberg probably wasn't aware of, like things like scarcity and how scarcity plays a role in the art world in Cuba. Um, and this is really, this is the moment, I think 20 minutes into Robert Rauschenberg's very kind of long-winded and, and very unfocused uh, talk about his artwork you know, with a translator translating into Spanish, the Grupo Provisional enters with a poster, um, which you can see here. Um, let me ask you guys: What do you think is what do you think is the image here? Uh, what is this person on the painting here? Um, is there anything that this picture does this summon any imagery in your mind? Is it? Do you know what they might be going for with this image here? Chance for me to take a breath. I think he's doing like a, a Taino Indian, like a Taino Native American. So this is kind of a Native American, Taino Indian, maybe the equivalent of Hatue, um, 
it's kind of crying out against the colonizer. So this is perhaps very good. Rauschenberg is what the Native American is saying. Yeah. So the bottom says Grupo Provisional. So that's the name of the group. So they put together the, this imagery of of a Native American who's who's saying very good Rauschenberg, kind of mocking Robert Rauschenberg. Um, and they enter the conference carrying this huge placard. And, you know, they're announcing that this is part of the group of provisional. And I think at this point, a lot of people in Cuba knew about them. And so they're they're kind of declaring, they're proclaiming their sort of interruption of this performance with this sign that's mocking Robert Rauschenberg. And so, you know, here they are using performance as a kind of to, like kind of what you see on YouTube today to punk, uh, to prank a, 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 you know, to, to knock Robert Rauschenberg down a few pegs and to kind of you know, add some real life to this otherwise kind of boring, wandering, meandering uh, conference, very kind of boring um, to the Cubans, especially because of the language barrier, but also because I think, you know, it's hard to talk about Rauschenberg's work without it kind of being somewhat general and vague. So this is a very exciting moment for the Cubans, I'm sure, because there's a moment of wondering what's going on. And they approach Robert Rauschenberg with the placard and people start taking photographs and wondering what's going on. And people who know about Glexus Novo are probably saying, oh, that's the Grupo Provisional doing their latest um, performance piece. And then he approaches with several other members of the group. And this is the part that everyone gets wrong. So everyone assumes that Robert Rauschenberg signs this poster here. Like if you read testimony from all the big scholars on Cuban art, they'll say that Robert Rauschenberg was approached by Grupo Provisional and Glexus Novoa, and that Robert Rauschenberg signed the very good Rauschenberg poster. But as you can see here, he's nowhere near the poster, which is on the right. In fact, what Robert Rauschenberg is signing is something on the table there. And you could see why people couldn't see it because that other poster is so big. And so what he is signing, in fact, is one of the posters that Robert Rauschenberg made. And so Glexus Novoa goes up to Robert Rauschenberg and says, will you sign this? Uh, like, like, or he might have said, let me have your autograph. I can't remember. Basically, sign this. Here's a brush. Here's some paint. And Robert Rauschenberg says, why this? Referring to the brush. And Glexus Novoa says, it'll look better this way. And uh, it will, or, which is probably, you know, it'll be more valuable this way because, you know, I don't know if Glexus Novoa still has this poster that Robert Rauschenberg signed, but he would be nuts not to still have it because it will be worth a fortune. And so, in fact, you can see Robert Rauschenberg signing his very distinct name and this distinct style that he uses to sign his name on the poster. And I don't think there's any doubt when you look at this, even though the photography kind of washes out the colors, it's quite clear that he's signing the poster that Rauschenberg made made for the event rather than the very good Rauschenberg other sign that the Grupo Provisional made. So it's very clever. Robert Rauschenberg, or he's giving Robert Rauschenberg a poster that Rauschenberg himself made. So he's kind of signing his own artwork, which really, you know, you know, what a clever capitalist move by a non-capitalist, right? Genius. And like I said, if, if he still has this poster, um, uh, Glexus Novoa well, you know, has like lightning in a bottle. So here is another, you know, you can see it from another angle. Rauschenberg is clearly signing his name onto one of his posters. And at the very end of signing his name, he doesn't lift the brush. He lets the brush fall onto the pants of Glexus Novoa, whose pants now are also marked with Robert Rauschenberg's signature or paint from the paintbrush. And so hopefully, you know, he also has those pants, the plaid pants, because those also have Robert Rauschenberg's signature on it. But I think that's a nice, not a nice, but kind of a, a fitting gesture by the other artist, Rauschenberg, to mark Glexus Novoa's pants. Um, so there's sort of a, a, a cross pollination or, you know, the inter exchange goes both directions. Um, and so both of them leave this momentary exchange kind of being marked or having met, left their mark. And then none of this is on the program. None of this was part of the official conference. This is all kind of outside the revolution. And like I said, a, a moment for Robert Rauschenberg to finally impact, literally impact, you know, a local artist and to have an exchange between the two in spite of those language barriers or cultural barriers. And you can see it's a very, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie and joy in this moment. And Robert Rauschenberg gives the paintbrush back to Glexus Novoa. And Glexus Novoa says, thank you very much. 
and the group departs and the mission is accomplished and life goes back to normal. So how does Rauschenberg impact Glexus Novoa apart from painting his pants, which is cool. So here's an example of Glexus Novoa's artwork made the year after Robert Rauschenberg's visit. And you might, I don't think this, you know, this is certainly up for debate, but it could be that the red star becomes a more prominent or a prominent part of Glexus Novoa's artwork uh, because perhaps Robert Rauschenberg made that such an important symbol of uni unity and bridging uh, the two countries. Um, remember in the background going on is the end of the Cold War, the blurring of the boundaries between capitalism and communism. Remember there's a, the, the star in a Rauschenberg uh, painting in the poster there. So the, the star is a really fitting symbol for the 19, late 80s, 1990s as a bridge perhaps, or a common denominator, visual common denominator between East and West, uh, North and South, whatever. Um, perhaps also though, um, I think more clear example of influence is here. This is a work of art that Glexus Novoa made in 1989. And you know, a moment ago we saw that he was criticizing Robert Rauschenberg for his macho size scale artwork. And it looks to me like Glexus Novoa embraced macho scale artwork uh, shortly after Rauschenberg's visit. And so, you know, I don't know if Glexus Novoa maybe unconsciously or maybe he was already going to go kind of go big, uh, but it seems like there might have been uh, a positive impact by Robert Rauschenberg left on Glexus Novoa, who perhaps was sort of someone hungry for um, how to move forward into the next era of art knowing that there was a lot of political changes on the horizon. And in fact, really what I think he's realizing in by 1989, that in fact, yes, the world Cuban art world and the, or at least the Cuban, the uh, Cuban society is about to get turned upside down on its head, like a turtle that you kind of flip onto its shell very much. Cuba will be kind of struggling to, to write itself. And I think that continues to be uh, the reality in Cuba today. And you gotta love Glexus Novoa's artwork. It's sort of like you can really see that he's critic, like he's pushing political buttons without it being so perhaps politically hostile. You know, he's he's using kind of the language of propaganda, uh, iconography of the revolution, Che Guevara, without it necessarily making sense. It's almost like graffiti, like political graffiti, if you will. Um, yeah, that's so like political graffiti. You know, graffiti is almost by definition unintelligible, right? You're not necessarily meant to read it. It's like an it's like an inner joke or uh, inside joke or a, a coded encoded uh, language. So I like the idea of like pol political graffiti because it's kind of neutralizes the clarity of political um, slogans. So his artwork definitely, you know, I think re re reacts and, and shifts, continues evolving. Um, you know, both performance and visual arts. Um, in Cuba into the 1990s, but because of changes going on, he leaves Cuba in 1995, like all these other artists we saw from the 1980s. So what is making all these artists eventually leave Cuba? Because as we've just seen, we are in the middle of a heyday in Cuban art in the late 1980s. Well, we'll get back to that subject in the second half of class. You might notice here that the Robert Rauschenberg poster, these sell for $3,000. So this is kind of the, the final epilogue on Robert Rauschenberg's side um, with his posters that he makes in solidarity with Cuba, kind of going back to the United States with him and selling on the art market for $3,000. So that's kind of the, the last uh, kind of word on that side of the cross-pollination there. And I think this is, you know, this brings us back to the performance piece where when you, um, when Fidel Castro, when, sorry, when Ra Rauschenberg visited Cuba, he spent his first night hanging out with Fidel Castro well into the, well into the night. And so that's when what Fidel Castro is referring to when he says that he stayed up talking with Robert Rauschenberg uh, till early in the morning, almost kind of claiming that he had this sort of super ex personal experience with Robert Rauschenberg. But the irony there, of course, is Glexus Novoa knows that he himself had this personal re experience with Robert Rauschenberg. And Fidel Castro would never really even know about that because it all took place kind of outside the revolution. And remember, that's a very important idea outside the revolution because nothing is outside the revolution. So there's a really a lot of depth to this moment with 
the, that Gleisis Novo was sort of satirizing Fidel Castro, quote unquote, Fidel Castro, and Fidel Castro feeling like he kind of, he knows everything about the revolution and is fully aware of everything, but in fact, he doesn't know everything. And Glexus Novoa, in fact, was able to kind of operate outside the revolution. And there's a certain kind of bittersweet irony to all this, especially because Glexus Novoa is escorting Fidel Castro around an exhibit that's not in Havana. It's in the United States. So I think that ultimately is is the, the bitter part of the bittersweet, because even Glexus Novoa kind of abandoned um, Cuba, uh, because maybe you could say Cuba abandoned him or abandoned perhaps, uh, you know, or the Soviet Union abandoned Cuba. So we'll learn about that um, in the second half of class when the Soviet Union collapses and many artists um, flee Cuba seeking a better life in addition to many Cubans who flee Cuba uh, seeking a better life. So let's take a break there and um, and we'll pick up with the special period when we get back. I just want to tell people who weren't here for the very beginning, just to make sure you look on Canvas at the guidelines for your final paper. And don't rush if you want us, if you still haven't found an artist, we'll be looking at more artists today, uh, quite a few at the end of the second half of class. And then you can wait until the next class if you wanna see more contemporary artists. And I will extend the deadline for your final paper so that you have more time. Uh, just make sure you look at the guidelines and take a look, finish up the reading in both of your books if you wanna scour those for more artists to write about. So let's take a 10 minute break and we'll pick back up at about 9.40. And if you have any questions, by all means, you're welcome to. Um, Ask away. If not, I'll see you in 10 minutes. So we pick up where we left off in 1989, 1988. And here in the picture, you can see Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and Fidel Castro making a public appearance of solidarity and support, which is belied by the reality of the Soviet Union committing to perestroika, which is the restructuring of the econo economy of, of the Soviet Union, and then eventually to glasnost, which is greater openness culturally. And I think you can see in the background that guy clapping is well aware that there's a lot of uncertainty. So this is kind of the public display of, of, of solidarity, but behind the scenes, everything, everyone was aware that the Soviet Union was probably going to collapse. And in a way, this is a big victory for the United States for capitalism. And there is kind of a period in the early 90s where I think up to September 11th, where the United States, like after World War II, was sort of the, you know, the, the, the final, the last man standing, the last person standing, the champion of the free world. And of course, with the Bush administration and 9-11, everything kind of went to pot again. But at this period, this is the kind of end of the Cold War. And if you can see the quote here at the bottom, this is a quote from a Cuban artist, and she says, from Tamara Bringa, she says, Glasnost, this is a Glasnost, which is the cultural opening, um, had gone too far. And this is a, uh, talking about the situation in Cuba. Uh, all the way to the kiosk of the Caribbean and the Soviet and Soviet media were beginning to publish content, quote, not recommended for Cuban readers. Maybe that's why I have no memories from that time of the Tiananmen Square massacre or the fall of Berlin Wall. So basically, she's saying there's a media blackout in Cuba about what's going on around the world because Cuba doesn't want the same changes taking place in Cuba that are taking place around the world, particularly with the fall of the Berlin Wall in Germany. Now, Tiananmen Square is another a different issue that's of course in China and of course Tiananmen Square doesn't result in a major changes at least no kind of grassroots social movement or anything like that so China succeeds in kind of avoiding that kind of changes that happen in the Soviet Union and that's exactly what Cuba wants to try to avoid and I think you could argue it does avoid those changes but I think the difference is China is a economic super powerhouse engine of the world whereas Cuba is just a tiny little sugar producing country in the Caribbean so big difference in terms of your political economic clout between China and Cuba. Um, and here, Fidel Castro, I think, is really, his face says it all. You can really feel the feel him realizing that the revolution, his revolution that he fought for in the Sierra Maestra is um, on the verge of collapse if the Soviet Union collapses. And of course, if the Soviet Union collapses and Cuba's left all alone, that 
suddenly means United, that Cuba is susceptible, vulnerable to the United States. And that, you know, you can imagine how many hours Fidel Castro stayed up late at night wondering about, you know, what to do about the future. And of course, it, what, it, what it might have meant would be letting go of some of your power and maybe holding elections or at least having some kind of change that doesn't necessarily mean a total reinvention of the revolution but that you know goes to show the the nature of the problem of you know wanting to preserve the revolution without um and maybe reforming it to a degree um without that sort of starting a, a domino or a snowballing effect that would kind of destroy the revolution inside out and so the cuban government does end up succeeding and not allowing for too much internal changes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Cuba, you know, the, preserving the revolution while Cuba itself, you know, goes to pot is not necessarily, you know, that's not a solution. So this is a very major change in Cuban history. This is maybe the equivalent of the U.S. depression times 10, um, because when the Soviet Union collapses, or at least when the Soviet Union cuts off its lucrative exchange of oil for sugar, Cuba has nowhere to turn, nowhere to whom to turn for economic uh, support. And in a way, Cuba finally has to stand on its own two feet. And in a way, you can say Fidel Castro really exposes the fact that Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution never diversified its economy away from sugar. And so its dependency on a foreign power continued, you know, from Spain, then to the United States, and then to the Soviet Union. And now Cuba's all alone. And it's almost like gone back to the Stone Age because of uh, the lack of, you know, electricity, reliable electricity. Um, and at the same time, especially today, we've got the rest of the world that's, you know, hooked up to the wazoo on Wi-Fi and smartphones and, you know, all that is in stark contrast to the everyday life of the average Cuban who perhaps could have afford a smartphone or have, but, or, or have some kind of communication, but all that does is kind of deepen or, or put into sharper relief how kind of far behind Cuba is or how out of step Cuba is with the rest of the world. And, you know, I don't think any of us want Cuba to just sort of become another Cancun. But at the same time, you don't want Cubans starving and not having electricity and not, you know, having basic education. It would best be Cuba is returning back to the various conditions that the Cuban Revolution fought against. So in this period of the late 80s, as I said earlier, you've got a lot of censorship to prevent people from, you know, inciting the kind of social movements that led to Tiananmen Square in, the, in China and the fall of the Berlin Wall in Germany. And so how do artists respond? Well, here's a great example of using performance art as like a metaphorical refuge from censorship. Here are these uh, artists decide to throw a baseball game because they realize, well, maybe the best way to get away from uh, the sort of radioactive environment of in, in institutions um, worrying about paranoid about um, you know protest or and and maybe the the specter of censorship. Well, having a baseball game was like a way like a pressure release valve or even also a metaphorical show of solidarity in the face of censorship. And an artist who we're going to see today on the very far right there. Um, Angel Delgado, you can see with the mustache uh, second to the right, we're going to see him in a moment. So this is like a baseball game um, between artists, and it's sort of a metaphorical challenge to the state. And it's a great example of showing how performance art is kind of safer than, say, something like this, which we saw last week with Antonia Itis, pushing buttons, I guess, deeply and pushing them enough to make her become a pariah in Cuba, you know, not maybe a pariah, but certainly lose her status as an artist, um, at least kind of forces her into kind of early retirement, as we saw until the late 80s, when she's finally honored with the Felix Varela Award. Um, and I think, like I said, this is the Cuban government, even though there's a lot of censorship at the time, it's starting to understand the value of the arts as a tool for extolling the virtues of the revolution, the achievements of the revolution. So it's walking in this narrow tight tightrope between wanting to censor art, but also wanting to celebrate the artists because they are the sort of champions of the revolution. And this will become more so the case in the special period when the Cuban government suddenly needs to start attract tour attracting tourism and foreign investment to Cuba. And 
knowing that the arts are a great way to at attract foreign investment. So the Havana Biennial and these new art galleries in Havana, uh, the government's new interest in supporting art, although you know not 100% absolute support, is part of the reason why I think they finally give Antonia Aydas the sort of honor she deserves in 1989. She, she's given the award. And then two years later, more importantly, they put together an exhibit of her work and I think this really goes to underscore the changes going on in Cuba and how the Cuban government is really getting fully on board with the arts as a way to show that the Cuban government is not just a total waste of everyone's time or the Cuban revolution wasn't just a waste, but rather it's accomplished quite a quite many a number of things addition, in addition to, um, you know, public education, uh, medicine, uh, public health, um, electricity and other things, education, literacy, also support for the arts. And so the artists will become almost like an international, you know, like almost like a Che Guevara exporting the revolution, or at least uh, like a international uh, emissaries of the Cuban revolution. And remember, we saw last week, a lot of Cuban artists will leave Cuba by the 90s seeking opportunities elsewhere. But that comes with a cost, which means you lose that authentic Cuban kind of that that exclusive status as a Cuban artist subject to the sort of uh, the, the, the government, the, the communist government. And once you leave Cuba, you lose some of that clout as a Cuban artist. And so but in the to the 1990s, the Cuban artists realizing there's these shifts going on, they will wisely, or at least some of them will eventually realize you don't necessarily want to leave Cuba permanently, but of course that comes with trade-offs. So most of the artists we're going to see today are the ones who leave Cuba, particularly because Cuba gets pushed to a point where um, staying in Cuba means, um, and even today I think that's true, staying in Cuba means really suffering on behalf of the Cuban revolution without a lot of, of uh, hope for the future, unless you're an artist who has the ability to leave Cuba and come back. And that's will be the case for a lot of artists today, as we'll see next class, when we look at artists in Cuba today who are very much the sort of final, last kind of champions of the revolution who are kind of benefiting from the revolution to a degree. So why leave Cuba? Well, the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 9, 1989. And I got to say, I was I was about 10 years old when this happened. It's very exciting stuff because, you know, up until 19, late this time, people were still afraid of nuclear war. I mean, I think you should still be slightly afraid of that. Um, but it certainly changes once the Soviet Union collapses. And you just look at all the people. These are young people who are all, you know, taking to the streets and climbing on top of this barrier, this kind of political barrier, which kind of arbitrarily divided a country um, right in the middle. And so this is a time of tremendous social change and excitement, and the world is kind of coming together at the end of the Cold War. And, you know, this is, you know, a lot of hope, a lot of youth, a lot of... Um, a lot of excitement about the end of the Cold War. And this, I think, continues well into the 90s for most of the world, with the except, you know, notable exception of Cuba and other places, which will still be very much economically and politically isolated. And here you can see the Berlin Wall really cut right down the middle. And this is something established after World War II and continued well into the 1980s because of that polarization, political polarization between the East and the West or the Soviet capitalists and the United States or the West and the Soviet, that's where you get kind of the East versus the West. The Iron Curtain is another term for the Berlin Wall. Um, and this is a real kind of division, a real meaningful division, um, but one that now is crumbling. And here, you know, classic European style, the peg leg jeans with the white socks. I feel like White Sox, there's something growing up where White Sox were like European and Black Sox were American, but I don't know, that might have shift now, shifted now, but it's definitely kind of European uh, style here. And the blue jeans are a symbol kind of a capitalism in a way. And here's literally someone, you know, hitting, taking the sledgehammer and knocking down the Berlin Wall. I mean, I can remember in New York City, people were selling little pieces of the Berlin Wall as little keepsakes about the end of the, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in Cuba, here you can see a headline that says, Cuba ha entrado en, un, en el periodo especial. La situación no es aún muy aguda. Um, so 
it's basically we've entered the special period and that's the mother of all euphemisms, a special period. Euphemism is like a nice way of saying something not so nice. Um, so one of my history teachers is cool. Oh, ha you one of your history teachers had a piece of the Berlin Wall. That is so cool. That is so cool. Yeah, a little. It's like having like a little asteroid, a little piece of a, like a political asteroid. Um, you no, know, I was in New York on 9/11, and the day after 9/11 in Chinatown, they were selling you know postcards of the, the World Trade Center. So in New York, whenever there's something like that, there's immediately someone in the street uh, selling pieces of history, right? So the headline here. Uh, oh, and there's the whole section, and you know, very interesting. I'm so glad you shared that with me. Yeah, really, you know, I guess people could collect all the pieces of the Berlin Wall and reassemble it somewhere one day if they wanted to. Uh, and yeah, just the fact that the the piece of the Berlin Wall is now inside the Hard Rock, what the Hard Rock Studio is. Uh, there's, you know, it's so ironic that's the 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 wall between capitalism and communism. Pieces of it now lie in, a, you know, the Hard Rock Cafe, which is like you know, the temple of ca capitalism, one of the many temples. So, you know, the headline here in Cuba is really, I think, goes to show, you know, you know, what do you do with such, you know, the our country, the Soviet Union, our lifeline has collapsed and now we're entering in a special period. And that's sort of like saying, you know, honey, I'm, I'm leaving you, I'm taking the house, I'm taking the children. So we're now entering a special period. And that's the same kind of like, language meant to mask the sort of seriousness of the situation. And, you know, it's this is one of those moments where it's nice to have a, a free press and not just state-run press, because then at least you could have a better sense of credibility about the information you're getting and maybe have an independent voice. But, you know, even in the United States today, I would assume, I would assume that all the major networks, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, they're all run by bigger media corporations that probably sell weapons or something of oil. And so they have their own agenda too. So it's not like the United States has this amazingly free independent press. Nevertheless, just focusing on Cuba, the situation is extremely dire. Um, uh, you know, here's, I'll show you some of the changes in just a moment. So 70% uh, of its trucks, you know, dependent on oil for 70% of its trucks or dependent on the Soviet Union for importing 70% of trucks 91% of fertilizer. So overnight, all of the cattle in Cuba dies because it's dependent on um, maybe food raised by from fertilizer and meant to feed cattle. 70% um, of its iron came from the Soviet Union, 74% of its grain. I mean, these are numbers that are just jaw dropping. Uh, imagine depending on someone else for 70% of everything you need and 100% uh, for its oil which Cuba had been trading uh, its sugar for, for oil. So it wasn't just the dependence on the Soviet Union for oil, but a dependence pretty much for everything. And why did Cuba allow this? Well, because it became politically important for the Soviet Union during the Cold War, but somewhere along between maybe now 1960, uh, somewhere into the 1970s and 1980s, Cuba should have diversified its economy, anticipating that maybe it thought that the Soviet Union would last forever, and that's fine. But even if it did, you still want to diversify your economy. So like, for instance, right now, the Soviet Union still is dependent on oil for 50 percent of its uh, GDP, which is, you know, maybe not the worst situation. But for instance, the United States is so diversified that if any one industry collapses, it has, you know, Silicon Valley, we have agriculture, we have Hollywood, we have all kinds of other things that make us less dependent on other countries. So it's a good move always to, you know, not be dependent on anything, right? And so as a result, Cuba overnight pretty much goes from somewhat prosperous, somewhat okay to, um, you know, total economic turmoil. And so it has to really act quickly to avoid, um, you know, everything falling apart very rapidly. So, you know, the goal here, I think, is to diminish the rate of the acceleration of disaster, of uh, the diminish the, the acceleration of this whole society falling apart. So it's more of a kind of less of a what less catastrophic, I suppose. And so the kinds of things you see in Cuba in this in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union are these giant buses, these, I, I can't remember the term, the camelo or the wawas, maybe Raymond, you know, might, might know the term, but these kind of incredibly dehumanizing, like turning a semi-trailer into almost like a, like a, like people packed like sardines in the back. And this is just a way of maximizing public transportation for very minimal oil. 
and Cuba imports millions of bicycles from China. Uh, the GDP shrinks by 35%. You know, people's calorie consumption diminishes by like a thousand calories a day. So people are really almost like not quite starving, but certainly there's, you know, you don't have any of that variety of food that you might have in the United States. Um, agricultural production comes to a standstill. Um, defense spending cut by 86%. Now that's great. <laughs> there's really, you know, that that's a good thing. And, you know, because really after the Cold War, there's no Brit Soviet Union, there's really no reason to be armed to the teeth. And they eliminate 15 government ministries. So you might wonder, well, what about the arts? Well, as like I said earlier, the arts will be a very important tool for the Cuban government to attract tourism. So even though it might be eliminating all this other stuff in a kind of maybe I don't want to say in a neat way, but for us, maybe in a really from the point of view of artists, it's cool that the Cuban government recognizes that the arts are kind of a essential services to, to quote the language of the pandemic. So the arts become a really valuable tool to keep the revolution afloat. So one of the big changes is that people no longer look down on people who leave Cuba. So before people would kind of you know, ostracize people who left Cuba and the Cuban government would see those who left as kind of pariahs. But now because the Cuban government was so needy, needy for money, um, you know, people who leave Cuba will send remittances back to Cuba um, from the United States. And so, you know, that the stigma of leaving the United States will slowly disappear, although it's certainly still the case where if you're from Cuba and you leave Cuba, you'll have a lot more problems in customs and at the airport than if you're a non-Cuban. Um, and I think some of that is also political kind of a, a paybacks more the, more so than just kind of um, more more so than bureaucracy. So other changes at the more you know ground level are apagones, which are blackouts, and that's that's sadly the case today. So in a way, we're kind of from the special period um, until kind of the era of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and the, into the 21st century, Cuba gets a little bit better, but then it goes back downhill again. Um, recently, in the last five ten years during the pandemic and during time of inflation. And I think things are continuing to get worse in Cuba with diminishing opportunities or uh, options for um, seeking hope or help from other countries. I think they're trying right now to build relation, economic relations with Africa and other countries in Latin America, but certainly Venezuela is not one of those countries. Um, we'll learn about that next week. So uh, disillusionment is really that kind of monster looking in the background, um, that sense of despair, uncertainty. You know, remember that feeling during the pandemic, uh, just kind of feeling like you're subject to forces that are beyond your control. You know, that's I think probably how it feels every day in Cuba. And, you know, these little kids are loving riding on the bicycle in this photograph. They're sort of, you know, blithely unaware of the reality that their parents are coping with. You know, it must be so hard to raise kids in a world where you don't, where you don't know, have control over their destiny as far as maybe you don't know if their future is going to be as prosperous as your own um, life has been. So, you know, it's certainly hard when your kids have a maybe lower quality of life, not because of anything you did, but because the country you've supported your whole life is is going to pot. And you can see some of the example of that mass transportation going in front of the Havana Libre, in front of the famous uh, mural we saw by Amelia Palaez. And more examples of resorting to, you know, medieval technology, you know, horse-drawn carriage is a substitute for oil and bicycles. And you'll see bicycles everywhere in Cuba. Um, today, particularly in Havana. And, you know, this image of Fidel in the background, this is from his days in the Sierra Maestra, really contrasts jarringly with the reality of Cuba in the foreground. You know, these cattle probably were, you know, they used to use tractors for, uh, yeah, it's, you know, very interestingly handed. That's a great subject for, in fact, some of my research as an undergrad was about the environment in Cuba. And you, you learn very quickly that, one, communism isn't necessarily better for the environment, but certainly the end of communism, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, 
was good for the Cuban environment because at least um, you don't well, have as many dependency on fertilizers. But of course, there's two sides to that, which you know meant less you know food and but but certainly um, you know Cuba has become a at least for a period it became a darling of the environmental movement because Cuba shifts to organic agriculture and really tries to adopt the kind of practices I think a lot of us would like to see you know places like the United States adopt. Um, one day, and not necessarily because it's just the result of, of the consequence of economic despair, but because it's better to eat locally than you know depend on monocrop food imported from far countries far away. Uh, you know, it's better to have bicycles and cars. You know, it's better to have uh, probably animal husbandry than tractor trailers. And so, in a way, Cuba inadvertently becomes a sort of bellwether for the environmental movement during the special period, and a lot of people get interested in Cuba at the time, me included, because of what you hear about the organic revolution in Cuba, not being dependent on fertilizers anymore, um, and, you know, shifting to organic. Um, and so, you know, again, it's not necessarily by choice, but rather by necessity, but nevertheless, it offers a really interesting blueprint for how you might, um, you know, rebuild society after economic collapse in other places in the world. And you, some of the photography, uh, you can kind of feel it that these photographers trying to capture that, you know, maybe energy in Cuba at the time in the 90s, which is, you know, anyone traveling to Cuba in the 90s will, you know, be confronted by a lot of poverty and um, Cubans who are very desperate to leave Cuba. And I think you, especially people at this time in life, you know, sextagenarians, septuagenarians, 60s, people in their 60s or 70s, you can really feel, I mean, you can see the you know, emaciation here and the sign of, you know, imagine, you know, waiting in line to get eggs and bread and, you know, having lived your whole life supporting the revolution to, you know, spend your retirement years, uh, you know, fa fa famished. So what does Cuban government do in response? Well, as we talked about, uh, and as I mentioned, attracting tourism is, you know, if you're a Caribbean country, if you're Florida, you know, people come to this part of the world for the sunshine, for the weather. And so now a lot of Canadians, Italians, Germans, and other people from around the world, not so much people from the United States, will go to Cuba for places like Varadero to enjoy the beaches and kind of avoid Havana altogether. But some, some people, of course, go to Havana because they want to see the arts or they want to see you know, the effects of communism. They want to see Cuba maybe before it changes and turns into Puerto Rico or turns into Mexico, Cancun. Um, but the Cuban government has kind of postponed that. And it definitely seems like you know the Cuban government is still very much the main political institution in Cuba. And the Cuban government the revolutionary government is the main property owner. It owns all the hotels. It owns all the farms. So we're really talking about a uh, a government that is fully kind of integrated into the political party. And so you can see how difficult it is to have change when there's really one party that controls everything from the hotels to the agriculture. And it also means it might be hard to really build new hotels and to um maybe attract foreign investment if the the Cuban government has its fingers all over everything. And so one thing Cuba does in the 1990s, it creates all these quote unquote NGOs, you know, non-government organizations, which are sort of like these kind of uh, ostensibly non-governmental, but still somewhat with one foot in the government. But it does this to attract foreign investment and to so that people wanting to invest in Cuba feel a little bit of kind of like they're working with institutions that are somewhat independent from communism, independent from the central government. Um, and it's doing all this uh, as, as a way to prevent what you, what we're going to see now, which is the Balsetto crisis, which is kind of the Mariel boat lift, um, you know, on steroids. So in, by 1994, enough Cubans have just said enough. I'm not going to kind of martyr myself on the, on the, cross of the Cuban revolution. And so they begin to make any kind of thing float that assemble it together um, and make rafts or boats and, or, you know, to get, find any navigable thing that can cross the waters from Havana or, you know, from Cuba to the United States and Florida, which is about 90 miles, which doesn't seem that far, at least on paper. You know, Sarasota to Tampa is about 60 miles. So, you know, by boat, that seems a lot further, especially if you're paddling. But as you probably know about the Straits of Florida, 
there is a lot of inclement weather, you know, hurricanes, um, bad weather in the summer. So certainly I, I would assume a lot of these trips would be taken in the winter, which means maybe a lot more cold. The water can get cold, but also there's a lot of sharks in the water. I think one of the most recent classes I told you about a student I have, an older student who is, I think, in his late 30s in one of my art classes, uh, art history classes at the University of Tampa. And he told me that as a kid, he and his parents, I don't know how however many people I didn't want to get into more details, but he told me that his parents and took him on a boat and they perished in a, in a storm. And I guess he survived as a little boy, which is horrible. I mean, you know, his whole high, whole life will be scarred by that. And, you know, you got to blame the United States to a degree for creating this policy called wet foot, dry foot. Basically, if you arrive to the United States on one of these boats, you will get automatic citizenship, which is great. You know, most countries, uh, a lot of people who emigrate or illegally or legally to the United States from, you know, Central America, from Mexico, envy Cubans because when Cubans come to the United States, they get a thousand dollars, they become automatic citizens, and they kind of get more red carpet treatment than you get from other countries, which is not to say that, you know, they're not still desperate and, and you know, in need of a lot more than services and just that, but it's our U.S. It's our policy that kind of incentivized a lot of people to leave Cuba. Which is not to say that you know it's it's isn't good that they left Cuba, but certainly the United States kind of incentivized people to put themselves into jeopardy, and a lot of people perished in the Straits of Florida in the 1990s trying to cross um, the Straits to come to the United States. Um, on these really, you know, just look at this boat. You know, the, do you really would you sail? Um, I wouldn't, you know, cross from St. Pete to Sarasota on this boat, um, especially across the Straits of Florida. And here you can see some other examples of, you know, people push to this kind of desperation to put together a boat and try to navigate across the Straits of Florida. Today, if you go to Cuba, you are not allowed, Cubans are not allowed to get on a boat with foreigners. And I assume that's because they want to prevent people from fleeing um, and or maybe take the the resources, the boat, um, perhaps. But that's a crazy rule that you'd never see in the United States. And I think it's directly in response to the sort of trying to maintain some sense of control. Now, keep in mind that if the Cuban government spends a lot of money on your education, you know, and, and I don't just mean like your college education, but from from the moment you're born to your, your college years and probably even paying for your university tuition and has invested all this money in, you know, healthcare, you can understand how a socialist country, a communist country will be maybe less likely, less predisposed to wanting you to leave and take all that investment, you know, in your, in your education and use that in another country. So that's kind of one of those things in the background that's maybe hard for us as people in the United States to understand and appreciate that you're sort of your education means that the government kind of, I don't want to say owns you, but kind of has a has a major, is a stakeholder in your kind of, you are, you it's a stakeholder in your destiny because it kind of invested in you. And so leaving Cuba means you're sort of taking all that investment elsewhere. And so that's kind of one other factor that isolates Cubans or because of the political circumstances, perhaps from the rest of the world. So there's many layers of isolation um, going on in Cuba. And add on top of this, the fact that after the Soviet Union collapses, you have the Cuban exile community, which consists of a lot of people who either are big uh, op opponents of Fidel Castro, maybe people who had have family who had their home confiscated by the revolution, uh, maybe, you know, just people who want a free Cuba, quote unquote, free Cuba, non-communist Cuba. And so the Brothers to the Rescue, which is maybe a little less, I think a lot less uh, prevalent today, they play a major role as kind of gadflies, as kind of provocateurs trying to inspire Cubans to revolt against the Cuban government in the 1990s to the extent that they drop pamphlets and they, they fly into Cuba over the in the airways air airspace and drop pamphlets um, encouraging people to revolt and the Cuban government responds by shooting down by by you know, launching airplanes and the air force and they shoot down this plane which causes a major international incident with you know, is a major international incident between the United States and Cuba and 
President Clinton in response um, tightens restrictions on Cuba even more. So the embargo gets even tighter, the economic embargo. So even though there's this moment where people think there could be change in the air, and even the United States government shows signs that it's going to be, you know, is willing to make amends with Cuba. Once the Brothers to the Rescue plane gets shot down, all that disappears, and the Cuban and the United States tightens its economic noose on Cuba um, and kind of be isolates Cuba even more. And any hope for uh, normalizing relations with the United States is gone. So in a way, the Brothers to the Rescue group, um, you know, if they wanted to free Cuba, in a way, they might have postponed it longer. Um, and, you know, that's a whole another subject, the Cuban exile community, but certainly something you have to remember. That's why the United States continues to be estranged because it doesn't want to set as set in stone the idea that if you confiscate American property, we'll just forgive you because then that sort of becomes the sort of that becomes a new standard. And of course, you know, the United States is all about private property. And, and, you know, you have to sympathize to a degree with people whose property was confiscated. I, you can't just dismiss that. But that said, you know, this is a moment of reflection. You know, even Cuban athletes who are kind of similar to Cuban artists are trained by the revolution. They're benefiting from the institutional support of the revolution. This is a famous Cuban boxer in 1993 says, quote, the Soviet Union helped us. but And so what happened? We didn't use any of that money to build a future. We became a country that created images in sports in art, in conscience, and in internationalism, in a series of things that are crazy in a country so undeveloped, underdeveloped. Now we don't even have toilet paper. So a real damning condemnation of the Cuban government, kind of hinting at some of the things we were talking about, kind of not diversifying the economy. But I think the most interesting part is just the idea of creating imagery. You know, it's almost like he's saying we create a lot of kind of things on paper, but not in practice. You know, it's great to make you know, artwork and make maybe billboards and slogans and, um, but, but the, the real substance was, was lacking or, and, or um, not as important perhaps as the politics. And I think that's really what he's getting at here. That sort of focus on politics rather than the economics of kind of just uplifting at the average Cuban. So how do Cuban artists respond to all this turmoil? Well, this is the artist we saw earlier at the baseball game, and he puts together an exhibit in 1990. It says, hope is the last thing that's that's lost, that we're losing. Uh, La esperanza es lo último que se está perdiendo. Um, and he's defecating on the newspaper, the Granma, which is the official newspaper of the Cuban revolution. The Granma was a boat that Fidel and Che Guevara and other revolutionaries invaded Cuba on in 1959. And so him defecating on the grandma is kind of like someone like in the United States defecating on the U.S. Constitution. You know, they, that's that's it's, it's as sacred, perhaps. And, you know, defecation, of course, is the ultimate, you know, in a way, I, I think it's an interesting segue from what this guy just said a moment ago about the absence of toilet paper. I mean, even you guys remember during the pandemic, the first thing that kind of becomes a kind of uh, an object a object of kind of uncertainty is toilet paper, right? And so I think we can relate to this and not just because it's like, you know, an everyday object, but also because it's kind of, you know, this, this thing that helps you attend to your own, you know, personal needs, but also there's an element of it's private, you know, in a way defecation is outside the revolution, you know, is defecating inside the revolution too. And, you know, defecating on the grandma is, you know, is, is outrightly, uh, you know, uh, combative towards the Cuban revolution. And I think, you know, there's no denying that Angel Delgado knew that he was uh, taking a big risk doing this. And so you could see this is a document of him actually performing his piece here. And he gets into a lot of trouble. It says in May 1990, Delgado created a performance um, in the group exhibition El Objeto Esculturado, the sculptured object at the Centro de Desarrollo de Artes Visuales that led to prison, where he spent six months of deprivation of freedom. Um, and this experience marked his life and his work. 
um, and the gallery manager were, manager was fired for allowing this performance to happen. So, you know, clearly the Cuban government is not going to just allow anything, even if you are an artist trained by the government. Um, and I think the symbolism, of course, of, you know, defecating on the grandma is really, you know, I think that's probably the, the reason why they uh, put him in jail. Um, and so performance art, this is kind of from the legacy, it, it very much a continuation of the performance art scene in the 1990s or 1980s under with Lexus Novoa. Now we go into the 1990s and now they're, you know, pushing buttons that are, you know, these are the buttons you're not supposed to push. It's one thing to do baseball games and to mock and satirize American artists. It's another thing to defecate on the official publication of the Cuban revolution. So you could see in a way that like, excrement becomes a motif in the 1990s um, you know, as a, I think, not and necessarily as a result of Angel Delgado's performance, so much as kind of it's it's a scatological or humorous kind of thing that's, I think, just addresses some of the things we just talked about. It's sort of personal, it's private, um, it's something detestable that no one wants to talk about. And that's very much kind of the language of euphemism, right? We don't, we don't, you know, we use a lot of euphemism to just talk about things that are private and personal. You know, I'm going to the loo. I'm going, uh, where are the, where's the, I need to use the services. You know, uh, you know, all the words we use to describe defecation. You know, I think that's a wonderful metaphor for the euphemism, the, the language of the Cuban revolution in this period. We're trying to pretend like nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. But in the mean, in the background, everything's going to, to bleep. <laughs> so, um, what does Angel Delgado do in response um, to um, to you know being in prison? Well, while he's in prison, he starts making all this artwork using banderas and using kind of uh, what are they? Uh, whatever materials he could find in prison. Um, I think uh, they're kind of like napkins. And he so while he's in prison, he makes you know it's an interesting parallel to Fidel Castro because. Fidel Castro was thrown in prison by um, Batista for rising up against Batista. So here you have an artist kind of symbolically rising up against the Cuban revolution. And he does artwork while he's in prison in the same way Fidel Castro, while he was in prison, um, wrote some of his famous uh, memoirs or writings about his role in the revolution or similar to Hitler when he was in thrown in jail, wrote Mein Kampf. So being thrown in prison um, is a sort of, you know, a, a light motif in the history of kind of people rising up against the powerful, you know, whether it's on the left or on the right. And here we have an artist, in this case, kind of making art while he's in prison. Um, and I think this is only kind of deepening his kind of uh, his stubbornness against the revolution. I think you could literally see him kind of referring to these, the maybe concentration like camp quality of his circumstances being thrown in jail for making a political statement, right? And it says here, the artist came to symbolize artistic censorship and had a profound impact on the Cuban artistic community, compelling many artists to leave the island in the years that followed. And as we know, leaving Cuba to seek other opportunities. For some artists, Cuban artists, it's been a real windfall, uh, economic windfall for them. For others, it might mean losing some of that Clout at being a sort of uh, an artist struggling in the confines of the Cuban Revolution and communism. So Angel Delgado is certainly someone who deserves a lot of respect for being bold and and you know doing something with performance that is you know here you can see uh, another artist um, reflecting on this uh, performance piece by piece by um, Angel Delgado. This is a time of scarcity a time of uh, soul searching, you know, economic soul searching. And like I said, artists have a kind of feel that there is a sense of shifting going on. And maybe that leads some to leave the country, but others who stay in the country find, um, you know, find refuge in art. Because remember, the artists are reeling just like the average Cuban, not much food, not much resources. So a lot of the art artists we're now going to see are artists who are still in Cuba and trying to find some kind of meaning um, in their in their art and finding some way to continue making art that's meaningful and I think very much responding to the realities of Cuba at the time. So here, Lazaro Saavedra is very much, I think, visualizing what's on people's minds that overtly, outwardly, you have to kind of still speak supportively about communism, but 
in your head, you're thinking about traveling the United States. And of course, in your heart, your soul is still very much, you know, you love Cuba. And I think, you know, most Cubans feel this sense of you know, being torn between the kind of the inner world, the outer world and what you're thinking. And, you know, that's just the reality of, you know, being like pulled apart in three different directions. You have your obligations to yourself, your obligations to your country, your obligations to your family. Um, and, and those obligations might not all um, be on the same page. So Belkis Ayon is a wonderful artist. I hope some of you write about, certainly some of my students last semester wrote about her work. And I love her work. It's partly because it's, she kind of retreats into Afro-Cuban culture um, and kind of, almost like a fitting inheritor of Wilfredo Lamb's legacy and also kind of a, a a refuge, a sanctuary from from what's going on in Cuba at the time. And maybe perhaps because of all these changes going on, she feels a little safer delving into more religious subject matter because the Cuban government so increasingly more open and supportive, at least of the arts. I think perhaps Belkis Ayon I think it's probably more of a personal decision, her wanting to connect more to, with, with her roots and using art as a chance to kind of bring the Afro-Cuban culture more to life in the way Wilfredo Lamb kind of brought it out of the shadows into the gallery and made it, you know, gave it, you know, flesh and blood by, by making artwork that perhaps takes Santeria or uh, Afro-Cuban stories, which are more ritualistic, and now illustrating these rituals, if you will. And incredibly, you know, incredibly kind of one of a kind artwork that um, kind of almost like transcends Cuba in a wonderful way. And it has that spiritual religious quality that you feel from Wilfredo Lamb, you know, vaguely perhaps hinting at this, but I don't think that's what's going on here with kind of, she's not politicizing the Cuban population here, like Itis was so much as kind of looking at Afro-Cuban religion with her artwork and it feels very removed from politics, but perhaps she's addressing the internal politics of the Afro-Cuban religion. Um, you know, this in a lot of her works, she she's portrays Sikan, a princess of Abakua re legend who was put to death for sharing sacred mystical information passed on to her by a sacred fish. So, you know, when I read that, you know, of course you'd want to illustrate that or bring that to life. You know, it's such a wonderful, whimsical, beautiful, almost magical realist um, uh, quality to it. And, you know, I don't want to read this out loud, but if you, if you look into Belkis Ayon, you'll find that her artwork maybe tackles some of the uh, challenge of illustrating this art, this religion, uh, the uh, Afro-Cuban religion, giving it legitimacy by visualizing it, but I think also looking at the role of, that women play in the Afro-Cuban religion. And you notice we're seeing more women artists in Cuba, you know, more than we saw in the 1980s, and this will continue. We'll see a lot more women artists in the 1990s and into the 21st century, and I think that's, you know, a really positive contribution by the Cuban revolution and shows that, you know, it's increasingly, the art world at least was, you know, I think, less machista, diminishingly machista, as we move from the 1970s into the 1980s and the 1990s. And Belkis Ion herself says, um, these works are the things that I have inside that I toss out because there are burdens with which you cannot live or drag along. Perhaps that is what my work is about, that after so many years, I realize the disquiet. So there's when you read this quote, it feels like this, you know, hyper-personalized stuff, but you notice she's talking about burdens and there is some kind of, um, some kind of, you know, personal something that, that this, her paintings are helping her alleviate. Um, clearly that must be the case because she ends up committing suicide in 1999 at the age of 32, which, you know, what a tragic end. Um, and no one really knows, at least, you know, as far as my research goes, the family isn't sure why she committed suicide. I can't say it has anything to do with perhaps the Cuban situation, but it does seem like her artwork was, is so rich because it's giving her some kind of very personal kind of uh, sustenance in the face of whatever inner kind of personal turmoil she's going through. And, and, it, and if she was going through some, you know, inner turmoil, it, 
the thing, the situation in Cuba must have only exacerbated that turmoil. So it's a very sad, uh, tragic ending to Belkis Ion, who you know, clearly her artwork is just real. I don't, it's just unlike anything I've ever seen. And even, you know, with Fredo Lamb is the closest perhaps I could get to it, but even that it isn't the same at all. It, you know, has some of the same color palette perhaps. And of course it is tackling Afro-Cuban religion, but I think it's a really fitting, um, she's a really fitting kind of, next step or update on the Wilfredo Lamb tradition. And remember, Wilfredo Lamb left Cuba. So in a way, we're kind of, he's an interesting model for this 1990s period because he's someone who decided, look, I'm, you know, I love Cuba, but I'm leaving. And so we see a parallel to that with these cute artists in the 1990s leaving Cuba as well, making that hard decision to leave their, their home country. So more artists from the 1990s kind of seek refuge in metaphor, um, maybe as a refuge from censorship, but also because there's something kind of a, maybe a little less, um, yeah, yeah, again, like it's less radioactive about metaphor in the same way performance art is kind of less hostile because it's more of a collective endeavor. So, you know, look for metaphor and some of the work we're about to see. Um, I think this one's, you know, pretty clear, a bird kind of trapped in a web, you know, it's a tropical bird, like a flamingo kind of trapped in netting, yeah, I think you could see the metaphor, um, a lot metaphorical. I'm just kind of going to briefly look at a few artists so that, and you can, if you like their work, you can explore them in greater depth for your paper. Um, but I think the most interesting metaphor from this period is water. And water is a really, I mean, I'm such, you know, water is life, you know, water is, is so many things. Um, we saw water last week when we looked at Tomas Sanchez's work. And, you know, you could see this as a waterfall, as, you know, nature, but you also, I encourage you to think of water as like a symbol for your humanity, your emotion. It's the water is the individual, the forest is society. So that is certainly one way of thinking about the metaphor of water change. A waterfall is, is a state of change from one state to another. And, you know, reflecting, looking out across at somebody else across the water is certainly something you could see as a metaphor for perhaps a Cuban looking across the Straits of Florida um, at Florida or imagining themselves across on the other side. And it definitely reminds me of all the time I spent on the Malecon. This is the Bayshore in Havana. And you could see this is a major hangout spot for Cubans every day of the week, every night, people are hanging out on the Malecon. If you ever do go to Cuba and you walk along the Malecon, be very careful. There's a lot of holes in the ground. You might fall in. So definitely if you go to Cuba, watch where you're walking. Um, you might hurt yourself. But so this is at like the coastline, the edge of Cuba. And it's almost like the Berlin Wall. You've got this insurmountable barrier to the West or to the United States. And so kind of coming to the Malecon almost becomes a symbol of you going as far as you can go. Um, and if you remember, we talked about the Cimarrones, the, the escaped fugitive slaves in Cuba, often ended up on the far eastern side of the island in Santiago, because that's as far as you could walk to Africa. They knew Africa is somewhere in the east, but once you hit the far eastern side of the island of Cuba, there's no more you can go. Like you can't get to Africa except by boat. So there's an interesting kind of, you know, almost mythological metaphor here of the, the Malecon being kind of another tragic reminder that Cuba's isolated. And, you know, I think this is where you would go to socialize, to hang out, to get outside of your house, to get away from the despair and socialize with your friends. But also it's this, you know, it's a chance for you to, re to wonder about the United States and to look across the water and, you know, freedom, or at least the idea, the, the, the possibility of freedom or the perception of freedom is so close yet so far. And here, yeah, more pictures of the Malecon. And I would say this is, you know, as important as like going to the beach in Sarasota. It's as, you know, as much of a fixture of life in Havana, going to the Malecon. It's a wide... Oh, by the way, do you know who built the Malecon? The United States... Uh, Army, the the Army Corps of Engineers built the Malecon during the uh, you know U.S. Uh, period of not occupation but U.S. Um, kind of domination of Cuba in that period of the early 20th century. So you can see the Havana Libre there, um, kind of going around the corner. That's kind of square building, 
and then that's the Nationale on the far right. And the very far right building, I think that's the Office of U.S. Intersection, which is inside the Swiss embassy. So we do have a presence in Cuba, uh, but it's isolated inside of the Swiss embassy. And so water becomes this metaphor for kind of the as a like a moat that surrounds Cuba. It's also kind of a metaphor for your own inner world. Um, maybe that's apart from the revolution, but water also becomes a very important symbol of danger. So what do you think this, so having talked a little bit about what, and learned a little bit today about the situation in Cuba in the nineties, what do you think this painting is referring to um, in terms of what you just heard about what's going on in Cuba? Well, let me not spend too much time because I want to get through a few more artists, but I think you could appreciate this is about maybe the shark infested waters on the way to Florida. And so water is not just sort of a, a source of wonder, but a source of danger and dread. And here the island is shaped into boats. Here, this is almost like, like slaves on a ship, um, kind of maybe the cr reference back to crossing uh, the Atlantic on a slave ship. And, you know, maybe perhaps a reference to, you know, crossing the Straits of Florida, kind of like imperiling yourself, or, or like return to that kind of age of, of slavery in a way. Um, and you see the water plays a ba major kind of element in this artist's work, the shark at least. And Cacho is a, an artist who, like some of you have seen his work, in a way, the boat as a symbol of, of diaspora, as a symbol of exodus or migration is still, you know, very common in the world of art, contemporary art world, boats um, and people migrating, uh, you know, we, you know, people migrating from Mexico to the United States, people fleeing um, dangerous situation in the Middle East. Um, even today, you know, people, you know, migration is like part of globalization. So this is a wonderful moment as far as, you know, using art to, process what's going on it's these are like everyday object found objects it's almost like kind of a little bit of robert rauschenberg but shoes and sandals it's all they some of them are transforming into boats you have a boat shape overall but it's kind of tragic because you know it's, a, it's almost like a, a mass exodus from cuba but also you can imagine people who die on the crossing maybe all that's left is like a floating shoe or floating sneaker so there's almost like the boat is a symbol of freedom but also danger and you know it's it's also something almost like you 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 will become just like floating refuse in the water um and maybe feel that how big the ocean is and how small you are um, but it's almost like a fleet a fleet of boats you know, aiming away from Cuba. And here the Miami Herald has captured some of the scenes of people fleeing in Cuba. And, you know, like, just look at how ridiculously small that boat is. And look at the Cubans watching them kind of depart. And yeah, you know, these are probably pictures taken from the U.S. Coast Guard as people are fleeing. And so this is the kind of stuff that Cubans who stay in Cuba or Cubans who leave Cuba will document and want to sort of talk about because it's not just, you know, Freedom is also tragedy. Like I said, my my student is both of his parents perished on the trip across. So they basically, you know, they sacrificed themselves for their kids' freedom. And all you have to do is once you arrive to Florida, then you're a U.S. citizen. So you can understand why people would risk this very dangerous passage. And a few more examples of what an important role the boat plays in Cacho's art. You know, I think it's pretty self-evident what's going on here. Tania Bruguera is another wonderful artist, you know, tackling this uh, subject of, you know, people crossing. Um, and she lost a lot of her close friends. So a lot of people, who, I don't know the numbers, but a lot of people died. And they, you know, we probably don't have the ability to know because a lot of it was very clandestine. Uh, and so I think a lot of this artwork is, is not people necessarily talking about the, the crossing so much as memorializing those who died during the crossing. Sandra Ramos, likewise, you know, all this water, the looking at the island, you kind of from a bird's eye view, the island as the human body, you know, her reflecting on her, uh, I don't want to say indoctrination, but sort of her education as a young child, the uniform of kind of being fully committed to the revolution, seremos como el Che, we will be like Che Guevara, is a sort of, that's the the goal, that's the, 
expectations put on the shoulders of young people in Cuba. And of course, she grew up in Cuba without those expectations before the fall of the Soviet Union. And now she here she's come of age and Cuba has kind of been pulled out from under her like a rug. And you could see kind of her, you know, taking, removing that clothing and, you know, the, being crucified on the cross is almost like, you know, you know, being crucified on behalf of the revolution. And the suitcase becomes a very important symbol. All people in Cuba will recognize this, this suitcase is a one-way suitcase. This is a suitcase you have for packing your things permanently. This is be like someone, a woman packs her suitcase to escape from her husband, her abusive husband kind of suitcase. Anyone in Cuba would recognize this suitcase as a one-way suitcase. It's not a suitcase with wheels that you bring with you on a, on a trip abroad to come back but it's a very powerful symbol that anyone in Cuba would recognize as a symbol of that one-way trip. So even though it's not a boat, it's very much about travel and departure and leaving Cuba. And again, the most important thing that defines a lot of these artists from this period is the, the focus on leaving Cuba as a one-way trip, not a two-way trip. And that will change when we shift into the next period. Now, this is a wonderful reference almost back to Frida Kahlo, her famous painting, My my Dress Still Hangs There. Um, you know, of course, in this case, it's a, a kid's uniform from, from school growing up in communist Cuba. But likewise, you know, I think reflecting on her coming of age and, you know, her growing up as a, you know, revolutionary child of the Cuban revolution and now as an adult leaving Cuba seeking... Um, seeking opportunities elsewhere. So she clearly delayed her departure until 2014, but she likewise, you know, succumbs to that gravitational tractor beam pulling people away from Cuba to other places. And, you know, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this artwork just to give you kind of exposure to more artists, but you can really see what an ubiquitous uh, presence water is in a lot of the art from the 1990s. Not all cases here, you know, here, there's an element of urgency, someone running uh, away. Um, but I think Alicia Leal um, is one of the ones I hope a lot of you consider writing about. Um, you know, again, I could spend a lot of time interpreting these. I think this one is a little more rich and loaded with imagery that uh, you know channels a lot of stuff we're talking about. You know, the idea of paradise, Cuba's a paradise, both tropical paradise, but also political utopia. And fleeing paradise, expulsion from Eden, is very much a, a fitting blueprint for the idea of leaving Cuba, leaving paradise. And so these artists are very cleverly, you know, their Cuban artists are very exposed to very well educated, um, uh, around, uh, more educated, I think, uh, a lot of people in Central America because of the Cuban revolution. And they're putting that education to use for their really wonderful artwork from the 1990s. And, you know, I think they're really torn on the inside between having the Cuban government support them and then but feeling like they have an obligation to themselves to leave Cuba. And you got to love how she's kind of using water as like a symbol of sexuality in the inner world. Freedom, you know, maybe sustenance. You know, I love her work. It's so wonderful. But, you know, the, here the boat is, you know, maybe less of a tragic specter, but still, I think you can appreciate that sort of the boat is loaded with, you know, and low, it's open to interpretation. So we're wrapping up in just a moment. I just want to point out and show you a final few examples. Um, and just to remind you, this slide says an aggressive context. Yes, very aggressive, like your uh, stultifying situation economically, politically, culturally, even spiritually. Now, in this time, the Cuban Revolution opens up. This is when the Pope visits Cuba and Cuban government maybe feels less threatened by religion and allows for more Catholic practices and Santeria and Afro-Cuban religion. And so, and I can almost feel the spiritual revival in Cuba on a personal level um, and maybe even a retreat into communitarian life. Um, let me show you briefly an interview with um, this art, this famous figure. You can go to Havana and go to this gallery that Sandra Ceballos opens called the Aglutinador, which is kind of like, you know, gluing things together. Let's hear briefly a little bit what has, she has to say. So here she was in a gallery. This is an Eastern Havana. Artist driven, artist focused. Let me go back to the glutinator. Camiones, bodegas, look. 
esta una etapa más radical en donde yo empiezo a trabajar sola so que tengo un coordinado laboratorio en este, en este the proyecto the 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 a trabajar eh, eh, sobre una base de, eh, más bien crítica eh, digamos dentro del mundo del arte nunca nos ha interesado a este eh, digamos un franco tirador político para nada eh, pero sí, eh, o sea, lo que se ha hecho ha sido justo, ha sido preciso y sin discriminación. Entonces eh, se hizo una, una exhibición que se llamó Curadores Go Home, en donde era muy radical, un punto así un poco anarquista, y donde había libertad para que los artistas participaran con lo que ellos quisieran y pusieran la obra donde, que, donde ellos quisieran. So I think just the idea of telling curators to go home, really you get the sensation that they're, they're kind of trying to reclaim the world of art and also finding a sanctuary, you know, making art a sanctuary from what's going on, you know, economically in Cuba. And I think she's really succeeded in arousing a lot of collective spirit in support of her gallery. And even today you can go see this gallery, which is really a very lively, vibrant place um, in the Western part of Havana um, near Vedado. So um, I'll almost finish, just want to kind of wrap up by pointing out this sort of moment of reflection on the role and, um, and the, the authority of Fidel Castro and the revolutionary icons like Che Guevara, particularly because uh, Che Guevara's body is returned um, to Cuba at this period. So it's a chance for artists to reflect on the sort of the the legacy of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. Now, Fidel Castro famously, if you saw from your reading, you weren't allowed to portray him taller, anyone taller than him, or to show him eating, which is kind of, you know, how ridiculous is that? It's like, you know, this, you know, very kind of, uh, you know, sad, <laughs> pathetic. So an artist showing Fidel Castro eating is a, you know, politically loaded thing. Of course, having Coca-Cola in the background is, you know, loaded with irony. And, you know, I think that's what Poirac is doing with these pick painting from the 1990s is he's reflecting on the sort of demise of the, the twilight of the patriarch. Um, it's just, of course, Fidel Castro, who will live much longer until 2016. But certainly people are realizing this is a time of transition and or reflection, uh, uh, maybe imagination about what will come next, who comes after Fidel Castro. So I think you can, as artists, you can kind of appreciate the juxtaposition of capitalism and communism here. But more importantly, you know, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara's pieces of his body or his bones being returned to Cuba from Bolivia is a chance for them, these artists to reflect on the legacy of the Cuban revolution and to maybe even feel a little more comfortable um, challenging Fidel Castro for the first time and the legacy of Che and Fidel. And we'll see that continue on in the next class. Um, and finally, I just want to show you that first exhibit we saw those, those microphones mounted on the Malecon. I think it was very much, you know, people taking, uh, re feeling like they, they, they have no voice or want to kind of take control of their voice or have a voice in a very stultifying situation of uncertainty, despair. Um, there's a lot of humor, you notice, a lot more sexuality, a lot more spiritual focus in the artwork from this period, while being very kind of, you know, intellectual and kind of, and I think very much in stride with the art world outside of Cuba, you know, whether it's kind of focusing on prim primitivism, it feels like kind of a, a, it feels like artwork that comes from Cuba. This isn't like photo realism. And, you know, it culminates with this exhibit, I think as part of one of the biennials in Havana where they mount these microphones on the Malecon. So we're going back, or at least on, you know, not always on the Malecon, but facing the water. And I think that goes back to what we're talking about with the water being a very important metaphor for kind of almost like a, I don't know what you would say, like a, almost like a tantalizing opportunity to leave Cuba or an opportunity to reflect on the reasons to stay in Cuba. And these microphones, which are just above the reach of this person, which are kind of rusting away on the Malecon, I can't help but feel a connection between that and the Antonia Aides use of the microphones, the podium. And you know, in just that sense, it's a wonderful honor tribute to the legacy of Aides. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it's certainly a kind of a motif that we've seen. And it's a very powerful, let me ask you guys, I'll, we'll just end on this because this is my last slide. What do you guys think about, what's, what is, when you see this, what do you think about this sort of, um, this 
this installation piece with these uh, these resting microphones mounted on the malecon facing the water. Um, what do you think is this? What do you think might be the message here? Does this inspire any thoughts from you guys? Do you like it? It does seem like a fitting response to this era of the special period and what's your role in Cuba. You know, the microphone is a very powerful symbol. I'm still trying to figure out what all the, the full range of things it could um, symbolize. Um, speaking out, oh yeah, so that you could say even speaking out against the United States. You are looking at the United States, um, you know, so there's, you, you could see it as kind of a political symbol, certainly against, and maybe that's why it's, you know, that's why it's so clever is because it could be interpreted in many ways. Um, I, I, I wonder if it's intentional for it to be kind of just above maybe the, the average height of people so you couldn't quite reach it. So, you know, like, see, so you have to stand on your tippy toes to reach the microphone. Um, yeah, so when you, when you a graveyard, that's interesting. Someone brought that up last semester. Um, like, when you say, like, a graveyard, like, you're kind of, like, you're, when you say the graveyard part, you mean, like, the rusted part of that? Well, they're kind of like tombstones, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And I think we would we assume that like the microphone is a symbol of you know having a voice, having a chance to express yourself. But the fact that they're not real microphones, you know, it's like if you give a, a kid like a little kid with one of those toy phones, and they're like, la la la, I'm pretending to be on the phone. It's kind of like that. You know, it's there, there's almost something like here's your chance to speak, but the microphone is totally useless, functionless. Um, yeah, speaking out, but no one to hear you. So, you know, it's almost like escape valve, a pressure release valve, perhaps, for this time where, you know, like, here's your chance to scream in public. Everyone has a mic. Here's your chance to scream, but there's really no no PA system connected to it. You're just screaming into the ocean. Yeah, it's like, a, or talking to the ocean. So it's it's almost like the equivalent of like if you go to a wishing well and you throw a throw a coin up into a fountain like almost like a microphone equivalent of giving you a chance to feel like you have a voice. Um, and I think I love what I love about it is it's not so it's it's not like spoon feeding you. It's it's really a clever and it goes to show just how how really brilliant the Q artists in Cuba are with performance, with installation, with making the most of materials, and especially with that kind of boundary between all of them. And I think they're so clever because they live in a society where you have to be very good at using code language and navigating a kind of the, the eggshells that maybe here in the United States, because we don't have the, the mother of invention, which is necessity. We are kind of the sky's the limit. I think it might, you know, makes us a little less, you know, maybe uh, uh, able to use this vibrant, you know, language of performance and or um, iconography of, you know, everyday objects. Um, you know, even Robert Rauschenberg, when he uses everyday objects, he's almost kind of like leaving it in the realm of poetry and spirit and transcendence, which is great. But, you know, that's maybe why he didn't seem so relevant to Cubans, because they're very much kind of, um, you know, subject to necessity and the political situation in a way that Robert Rauschenberg was just kind of blithely free from, um, yeah, speaking out, but no one to hear you, I think is, it's very powerful. And, you know, I think in a way the Cuban government has let the cat out of the bag with these artists. And I hope you agree in the next class, um, the level of artistry only kicks up another notch. And on top of that, these artists won't necessarily be reacting to the situation in the 1990s so much as now having their feet one foot in Cuba and one foot outside of Cuba, whether it's in Miami or in Spain or in other parts of the world. And that will only further heighten and, and, and enhance the Cuban art scene. Um, but of course, I think that today now that's a, a, a question where I think a lot of those artists might end up taking that step away from Cuba and having both feet outside of Cuba. I hope that's not the case. I guess you guys will kind of help decide what the future of Cuba is next class, because, you know, I don't, I can't imagine it won't, without some kind of influx of investment and or revitalization, I can't imagine that many Cuban artists will stay in Cuba much longer, especially if the economic situation continues. So there might be another 10 years max of Cuba continuing to build you know, most art movements, you know, you think about the pop art world, minimalist art, they usually last a few decades at most. I think Cuba, you know, could be a, you know, a little longer lasting. 
depending on what happens politically, economically in the next few years. So I'm sorry if we went a little longer than normal, um, but I think we were able to get to the end and and kind of come back to this very important symbol of you know having a voice, which is the microphone. And I don't know if that will continue to be um, a motif that we see in Cuban art, but we will definitely see in the next class um, artists reflecting on the end of Fidel Castro and also artists considering what the future of Cuba is now that the Cold War is over. And especially when Fidel Castro dies, you know, what is the future of Cuba? And that really, I think, is going to be the subject matter that artists have to in Cuba have to really kind of maybe have to envision or and we'll see some artists who are on the street making street art, which is much more like uh, you know, non-sanctioned street art. You know, this installation was sanctioned by the government, but the artists we're going to look at, not next class, but the class after that, are artists who are, you know, like Banksy, the Banksies of Cuba today, who are not at all sanctioned by the government and who are pushing buttons. In fact, last few months, I've been following this one artist, Julia Rodriguez, and he's like, every week, I'm like excited to see what buttons he's pushing more. And so we'll spend some time looking at his work. And so... Definitely, hopefully you've seen some artists you might want to write about for your paper today, but if you want to wait until the next class to see some more artists, we'll see a lot more um, next week. And certainly get in touch with me if you need help um, investigating any of the artists you might want to write about. Uh, any questions? It's an interesting situation, Cuba, right? With the artists who really get more, like the quality of art, you know, the art world just, you know, really, you know, reaches a climax in the more contemporary era. Um, and so that's, you know, it's interesting build all the way up through the revolution. Um, yes, we will be talking about that for sure. Uh, probably uh, a little more next class. Um, and and I will make a point to talk more about um, uh, U.S. putting people in prisoners, but certainly Raymond, if that's something you kind of want me to investigate more, um, maybe we can talk sometime between now and next week. Um, we did briefly talk about Guantanamo Bay, another class, just, you know, the importance of Guantanamo, I think you mean probably the prisoners after 9-11 being put in Guantanamo Bay. We'll talk about that certainly when we talk about the Bush era um, and Cuba becoming kind of a, a place of controversy because the United States continuing to have the Guantanamo Bay prison there. Um, but certainly I'll get in touch with you between now and next class, uh, Raymond, to maybe um, pick through that a little more and see if maybe there's something I want to make sure I include. But yeah, we'll definitely be talking about Guantanamo Bay and um, and maybe to a degree, the, you know, prisoners and protests going on in Cuba today. Um, but I'll get in touch with you, Raymond, make sure I cover all my bases there. So I will let you guys go on that note. Have a great day. Class dismissed. Um, and good luck with your other classes today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.